So thank you and welcome to the EDO's Sydney seminar on the New South Wales planning reform process and more particularly on the white paper stage. Um, at the outset, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation and to pay my respects to the relatives past and present. Can I also thank um, DLA Piper for hosting us today and um, unexpectedly putting on a spread for us as well. So please feel free if, uh, during the course of the discussion to go up and grab another sandwich or something. It's pretty informal. Um, uh, over the next hour or so. Can I also, uh, before I forget, thank the community for their support as well. Uh, EDO New South Wales has had some funding cutbacks and we have been asking the community to financially support us over this, particularly over this period, so that we can con continue to deliver the services that we do. Um, range of policy and outreach services that we're undergoing at the moment and that we will continue once the legislation uh, is turned on. And we're very grateful for your support and in fact could not do it uh, without that support. So we're now getting to the sharp end of a long running process uh, that began when the present government was in opposition. As part of an election promise, the uh, opposition, the then opposition, promised to do three things. Firstly, to repeal Part 3A. Secondly, to review the current planning arrangements, the Environmental Planning and Assessment Act. And thirdly, to restore the community's confidence in the planning system. The background to that is a long and complicated one. Uh, but essentially, as many of you would know, the current Planning Act has been around since 1979 and it has been amended ad infinitum during that period. It's begun, become a very complicated and at times politicised piece of legislation. And clearly was in need of an overhaul and there was generally bipartisan support for that. So upon assuming power, the government duly uh, repealed Part 3A and embarked upon uh, the review process. They commissioned an independent panel uh, comprising Tim Moore and Ron Dyer um, to go out and talk to community groups and the community more generally uh, about what they liked and what they didn't like in that planning system. They spoke to some 2,000 people and there were 900 submissions received as part of a, a that quite lengthy process in itself, and people were given the opportunity to be involved in that process. Subsequent to that, we had a green paper, and again, people were given the opportunity uh, to be involved. EDO New South Wales produced a number of documents about that process, and again, what we liked and what we didn't like, and critiqued that, and that's all available on our website, but we're now at that um, white paper stage where we have the opportunity to uh, be involved until the 28th of June. And the policy team who are doing the bulk of the presentation today will talk more about what having your say looks like. Today we're going to look at the potential strengths and concerns around the, the uh, white paper in six main areas. Firstly, community participation. Secondly, strategic planning. Thirdly, development assessment. Fourthly, infrastructure and building assessment. Uh, fifthly, how to have your say. And sixthly, it's not really sixthly. Fifthly, uh, we'll have a, a period of questions. As I said, the policy team will be doing the, the main substantive work today, and that's our policy and law reform director, uh, Rachel Walmsley, and our policy officer, Nari In general terms, can I just say this? There are some aspects of the white paper that we are supportive of. Uh, for example, the community participation charter, the emphasis on strategic planning, 
the modernisation, if you like, of the criminal compliance and enforcement regime, and the attempt, which has long been abandoned by governments in New South Wales, to link infrastructure and planning together. And it is, of course, important in the submission process to, to make it clear what elements of the white paper we do support, as well as what needs improvement. The flip side of that support uh, is some fairly serious concerns about, in many respects, those very same things. Um, we're concerned about the lack of enforceability of the Community Participation Charter in and of itself. We're concerned about uh, the, the fact that while there has been an emphasis on the strategic planning process, that's been used as an opportunity to turn off rights further down the, uh, the pathway. We would say, for example, that strategic planning is fundamental to any good planning process, but you still need the checks and balances further down the, down the line, and the reason that you do it properly in the first place is so that you won't have those problems to the same degree further down the line. We also have a more general concern about the enforceability of a number of provisions under the Act. That's just the general overview. Um, Nari and Rachel will talk with more particularity about the issues that I've already identified. So firstly, if I can ask um, Nari Sahuka to come up and talk to us about the themes, aims and objectives. Thank you very much, Jeff. And um, so we've got a bit of a seminar outline on the screen here. So uh, pretty much as, as Jeff uh, mentioned, uh, we'll go through some themes, aims and objectives, um, community participation, strategic planning, development assessment, a little bit on infrastructure and building assessment, and how to have your say. So themes, aims and objectives. Um, on the screen here, we've got um, a grab on the left hand side from the white paper, so the five key elements of reform, and these have basically been carried over from the 2012 Green Paper. Uh, so the White Paper's priority elements are, number one, a delivery culture, a shift from a perceived negative or restrictive planning culture to the delivery of positive and pragmatic outcomes, including ongoing education and innovation and regular performance reporting. Secondly, community participation, involving people in the preparation of plans and the vision for their local areas up front, <coughs> including the ground rules for local areas. So this is about early engagement rather than site-by-site -site consultation in most cases. Thirdly, strategic planning focus, so a major shift to evidence-based whole-of-government strategic planning in the development of plans, community and stakeholder engagement and decision-making. Fourth, streamline development assessment and approval with a five-track assessment system which makes greater use of code complying development and online tools and removes layers of assessment, including some interagency approvals and concurrences. Fifth, the provision of infrastructure, so planning for infrastructure at the same time as planning for housing and jobs, including new growth infrastructure plans and simplified local and regional infrastructure contributions. And I guess a sixth theme um, in the white paper that wasn't uh, featured in the green paper is on building regulation and certification. So to ensure better quality of construction and fire protection over the life of buildings. Uh, but in that theme, we don't see any specific proposals, for example, to update the basics building sustainability tool uh, or the standards for water, water and energy efficiency, uh, which haven't been updated since 2006. Um, on the right hand of the slide, we've also got uh, some of EDO New South Wales' best practice planning um, themes or principles. I won't go through these now, but the presentation will be available on our website if you have a look at further. So briefly, a uh, quick overview of the structure of the white paper if you haven't seen it yet. Um, uh, pretty much reflects the structure of the green paper with the addition of those um, building regulation um, chapters um, and an extra section on enforcement. Uh, we've also noted the two exposure draft legislation uh, or bills there. So the planning bill 2013, which contains most of the substance, and then the planning administration bill uh, with some of the um, uh, more administrative matters. 
So aims and objectives. The white paper key objective um, of the planning system is to quote, is to promote and enable economic growth and positive development for the benefit of the entire community while protecting the environment and enhancing people's way of life. It is about enabling development that is sustainable. Turning to the draft legislation, it includes nine objects, and many of these are similar to the current Act, but there's a clear economic emphasis, including relating to things like timely delivery and efficient assessment. So, for example, the first of the nine objects listed in the Planning Bill is to promote economic growth and environmental and social well-being through sustainable development. The bill goes on to say, sustainable development is achieved by the integration of economic, environmental and social considerations, having regard to present and future needs in decision making about planning and development. So, some potential strengths and weaknesses as we see them. In terms of strengths, the new objects broadly incorporate two important principles, the integration of what you might call triple bottom line considerations and intergenerational equity, or at least a reference to present and future needs. And a general environmental protection object has also been retained, although slightly less specific than the current object. But on the other hand, EDO New South Wales and others have consistently emphasised ecologically sustainable development and its five core principles at the apex of the planning system. The white paper in the bill set up a much weaker definition of sustainable development that will remove three important ESD principles from the planning system. Number one, the precautionary principle to be applied where there's an uncertain risk of serious or irreversible environmental damage. Two, the conservation of biodiversity and ecological integrity as a fundamental consideration in decision making. And three, the blue to pays principle, so better environmental costing and paying for environmental degradation, pollution and waste. While there is an economic emphasis to the objects, the bill doesn't include an overarching object as such, leaving decision makers with considerable discretion as in the system now. Also, the broad commitments to environmental and social considerations are not emphasised in the body of the Act itself in the way that economic factors are, and we'll go through that in the other areas of um, the white paper shortly. Overall, the new narrow definition of sustainable development is a significant step backwards for environmental protection in decision making under the new system. We believe a 21st century planning system needs to prioritise and implement ecologically sustainable development and its principles, not a watered down concept of integrated decision making. So I'll now invite Rachel up to talk about community participation. So in terms of what is proposed, the white paper showcases a community participation charter as the centrepiece of its commitment to community engagement. The charter is set out right at the beginning in part two of the draft bill. So the charter sets out seven principles to guide consultation. These include right to be informed, access to understandable information, that the community is to be provided with opportunities to participate in strategic planning as soon as possible before decisions are made. Consultation is to be proportionate to impact and open and transparent decision making. So the charter is to be given practical effect by a community participation plan. These are going to be prepared by each planning authority, so the body that makes decisions on strategic plans and development applications, so councils, regional panels, and so forth, in consultation with the community. The planning department will also prepare community participation guidelines to assist the planning authorities, such, such as the Planning Assessment Commission, regional planning panels, sub-regional planning boards, and local councils to develop their plans. The emphasis is very clearly on community participation up front at the strategic planning stage. The key legislative requirement in the bill relates to proposed minimum exhibition periods. In terms of potential strengths and concerns around community participation, uh, the recognition of the role of the community in a charter that is in the legislation is very important. The key role of the community in strategic planning is recognised and we welcome that. The mandatory minimum exhibition periods are in the legislation and they've even taken note of some detail that was in a lot of community 
submissions, for example, please do not exhibit things over Christmas. So that, that, that's nice. However, <laughs> we have some concerns, notably how the charter will be enforced. Many of the concrete details to implement the charter have been left to the development of future community participation plans and guides. The draft legislation reveals that the charter will be difficult, if not impossible, to enforce, as community participation plans will not be mandatory, and the community will not be able to challenge plans and some decisions, including legal errors. As the government has noted, community engagement, ownership, and acceptance of the new planning system is essential. The white paper states, once the community has participated in development of a strategic plan for an area, planning authorities can streamline most development assessment without the need to further consult with communities unless the proposal significantly departs from standards in the local plan. So if you miss the boat and don't realise until a development is going up next door, it will probably be too late for you to engage. However, there are significant capacity issues around ensuring that you don't miss that boat. The White Paper Vision hopes to engage general members of the public in a series of consultation processes on state plans, regional plans, sub-regional plans, local plans, possibly infrastructure plans, and also on detailed code development. All of this is absolutely essential for the community to have a say upfront on future development in their local area. Some of these processes will be concurrent, some are underway already, and require the community to digest and respond to a lot of information. If this approach proceeds, significant time, additional resourcing, expertise, oversight, review, and appeal rights will be absolutely essential. Other concerns that we have include, for example, the definition of community in the bill includes industry. This is logical in the sense that industry and business are part of the broad community and everyone should be involved in, at the strategic stage. However, in the experience